Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I didn't fix that. I actually didn't have a heart attack. They got in there and gave me new plumbing before I did. That's amazing. Amen. Appreciate the Lord. Appreciate your prayers. I just thank God for you. I think one of the hardest things I ever did in my life is when I was laying there in that bed. I'm a practical person. I make sure everything's planned ahead. I have to call and cancel airline tickets and trips and so forth. And that's all I knew to do is preach the gospel. And uh, so I knew I was going to be sidelined. But I do thank God for his blessings and for the opportunity to be able to again be on the pulpit. I could be in heaven. That would be better. I'm glad I'm here tonight. Amen. 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 I uh, want to just briefly mention, I brought some of those books. I know we have a lot of new people here this year. And we, uh, it's called Creating a Glory Atmosphere. It's about worship and how that worship creates an atmosphere where God dwells in. That's the reason most, a lot of churches, the presence of God isn't there. It's because they don't create an atmosphere for God to dwell in, to come into. And they're on the table out there, and we just ask for an offering of $9. Part of the proceeds of that goes to missions. That missions right now is Israel, and it will uh, help us greatly. So we have those and some newsletters on the table. Brother... Uh, Lee Ship, Brother Darren Downs went over and did the uh, conference for the pastors in Spain and the presence of the Lord was real. The pictures they sent me, uh, we was Brother Darren, you know, I, the, the ministers and their wives just laying on the floor, right flat on their faces, weeping. It's amazing, Spain, 2,000 years, never had a revival, never had a great awakening, a visitation. A few years ago, the Lord laid it on our heart to go there to talk to some of the leadership. And that first meeting that we set up, the uh, Brother Johnny, I'm never sure if I ever pronounce that right, I just call him what I think it ought to be. <laughs> he answers to that. It's his way to do it. Call them what you think. They answer, it works out. But he, uh, he said on the way from the airport where we were going, we had a good crowd, a lot of numbers. We had uh, Assembly of God, Church of God, Independence, Plym Plymouth Brethren. Somebody said, what's Plymouth Brethren? I don't know. I just knew they were dead. <laughs> they testified to being dead. They said they were dead. We had a few Baptist folks even there. We just opened it up. And he said, brother, he said, they don't, got a good number, but they don't know, know you. They don't know who you are. You know, as if some TV personality. And I just said to him, brother, don't worry about it. Those who hear his voice will be here. They'll come. And the first service, we had a word not not service, orientation Thursday evening. That's just tell us what we're going to do. And the Holy Ghost fell in that place during orientation. And everybody got to crying and the Spirit of the Lord moving. And I thought, man, we need to keep going. And I didn't know how to deal with that first time there. And Brother John May comes back to me weeping and said, we need to keep going. Amen. But since that day, there's been a great change in Spain. Amen. Great change. So we appreciate you, brethren. Uh, I wasn't able to be at the Roma. I call them gypsies. Somebody told me I was a racist. I said, they told me that it didn't offend them. And if that didn't offend them, why would I care what you think? And I said, you didn't. I did. And uh, where, I, where I'm from, nobody knows who Roma is. But they do know what a gypsy, who a gypsy is. And so we had the youth camp again with 185. Life-changing week for those teenagers. The first year, they never had one in, their, in the country of Slovakia for just the Roman. 
And the first year, three years ago now, they came, girls 14 years old looking for a husband. I don't mean a future husband, I mean a now husband. And uh, it, it was unbelievable. The way they were dressed, I couldn't, I'm, I'm just telling you, it's unbelievable. But that first night, you know, they came from broken homes, some of them have been abused, they live in squalor, filth, some of them, you know, it just varies. But the first night, when the man of God preached, I sit there, I was a little nervous of what he said. I said, we'll either have revival or we'll get run off one. But we had revival. And when he gave the invitation to pray, those teenagers came up and they lay on their faces on that floor and well for an hour. It's unbelievable. And God just moving. So I'm excited about what the Lord is doing. I appreciate his goodness, and I want you to continue to pray for us. If I take just a moment, it's been two years, I think, since it was here. But two years ago, November uh, 2015, I was with Brother Downs and a few others. There were five of us, Brother Downs' his brother, and we were in Israel. And I, I, like the old boy said in the South, I'm just glad to be there. I was excited about it, but we went up to Jerusalem and spent the night, and I was in a hotel room that, on a Wednesday night, and while I was just laying in the bed there, I lied on, I'm just laying there getting ready to go to sleep, but uh, the Spirit of the Lord came in that room and dealt with me about Israel in a way I've never had him to deal with me about anywhere else in this world, and I've been to a few places. And I said to him, Lord, I said, I, I'll do whatever you want me to do, little or much. I'll move here, back and forth, whatever that is, whatever you want. I said, but why now? I said, at that time I was 56 years old, just turned 58. But I said, why now? I could have been here years ago. Brother Clinton ran those schools there. And he said, son, it's in my timing, not yours. <laughs> Well, I said, whatever you want. So I'm immediately, I'm, I'm ready to plant churches, uh, train preachers, you know, all the stuff we do because I've done missions. This November will be 30 years. I've done it all as far as the feeding the poor and helping kids and widows and what have you know. Just So I'm ready to get right in there and do what we've done for 30 years. So this past, earlier in the, this year, the preacher I had helping me and I promised to support him for a while, all that, when I saw the integrity, I, I fulfilled my obligation, to my promise, but I ended that relationship because I believe in integrity, amen. And I felt like a failure. And I thought, I know I didn't miss that. I know that was, I didn't need another country to raise money for. I didn't need anywhere else to go. I didn't have enough time to go. And I said, Lord, I feel like a failure. I'm here to plant churches because almost without exception, almost every church is an Arabic speaking church. The uh, 15,000 Jewish believers, most of them are immigrants from Russia and Ethiopia. Very few, very few Messianic Jews there. Two percent of the country only Christian. That's including Catholic and Armenian Orthodox and Russian Orthodox. And I I that I feel like a failure. I told people that I'm there in the will of God. And what what do I do? I said, I've done mission for thir nearly thirty years, Lord, and I don't know. And he said to me, When you get through doing what you think you know to do, then I'll do it. Amen. You said he did. Well, he did. Because it offended me. A little. So I wouldn't have said it to myself. And I said to him back, I'm through. I, I don't know what I'm doing here. I honestly do not know. It's nowhere like I've ever been on earth. You don't just go in and open the church building up and say, all right, all you Jews, let's come on and have revival. <laughs> it is a felony, a crime.
crime to proselyte a Jew. It's a crime, a felony. They call that democracy, but that's, that's what it is. So when I said, I feel like a failure, and he took me back. And he said, I'm going to show you what you're here for. You, you want instant success. You want to be able to put in a newsletter. You started a church. You trained a preacher. You, things that, you know, excite people at the base. But he said, I want to remind you. And he reminded me of a, a year ago this past May, and I'll be brief. They took me in a van down to Gush Etzion in a bulletproof van. It was a Memorial Day for their soldiers and terrorist victims. And I went to a cemetery, actually. And in that van, we had government officials, we had uh, our, we worked for the government, we had business people, we had a Jewish rabbi's son, uh, all Jews. And in the van that day, the Jewish rabbi's son and I engaged in conversation, and he found out, just in the conversation, I've been a drug addict a bad drug addict, and he worked with young people after the military, and so he asked me what happened. Well, now, if they open the door, then you can talk to them. Well, he opened the door. <laughs> now, I began to tell him about that Sunday night, November the 5th, 1978, how that, that Sunday evening, my mother, I went home to take a shower. I was wasted on PCP. It gave me too much to live, the addiction, the chemicals destroyed the body, the mind. And so I've been telling him this, and he said, what happened? He just kept saying, what happened? <laughs> he was leaving me. Yeah. And I said, well, I agreed to go with her to church, to our service. And I said, when I got there, they had to help me in the door. He said, what happened? <laughs> and I said, well, that night the Spirit of the Lord moved. I'm talking to a Jewish rabbi, son. And I said, the saints of God gathered around me, laid their hands on me, and prayed for me. He said, what happened? <laughs> I said, I, I cried out to listen to this. You think God is not a, he, he doesn't work on our timetables. We do things sometimes out of, it just doesn't seem to fit. But I said these words, and the moment I said them, I knew I was raised in the church. I knew the Sunday school jargon. I knew all that. But I never knew until that moment in that van why I prayed like I prayed that Sunday night. He said, what happened? I said, I cried out, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And the moment I said that, I knew why I said that 37 years ago. Because thou son of David means everything to that Jesus. He said, what happened? I said, I was instantly free, instantly delivered, instantly in my right mind. And here's what he said, so help me God. He grabbed his arm in this van with all these Jews. He said, I feel chill bumps. I thought, no son, that's a Holy Ghost. About two or three days later, I'm walking down the street. Another Jewish lady had opened the door. And I'm talking to her, walking down the street. And she grabbed her arm and said, I feel chill bumps. Amen. Well, it just goes on. Last year we had to, I can tell you more, but we had the tour group over there in November. And I only preached, I had a little chapel service. I said chapel, a little devotional service between Gordon's Calvary and the Garden Tomb. I said, I'm going to preach a few minutes on the cause he lives. I didn't know the lady who owned the tour company was going to be there. And she showed up, but I wasn't going to change my message. She came and said, I preached on the cause he lives. 2,000 years ago, what it meant, what it meant to me today. There's a lady sitting there in that group of us, they're talking in tongues and crying and she sat in there and she put her hands over her heart and she said, I feel chill bumps. Oh no, she said, I feel something inside. I feel something inside. That same person, my birthday this year, May the 11th, sent me a greeting. And in that greeting, 
She said, you are a blessing to the world. And when she ended that, she put in Jesus' name, amen. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I said, Lord, I don't, I see what you're doing. One by one by one. Amen. I don't have a church of Jews yet. But one by one. Amen. 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 We get put it. We rent an apartment. Got the apartment. Got no furniture, no nothing in it. My wife and I headed over. I was supposed to be there in July to get all that. Now we're headed over next month. We didn't have no where to lay our head. But you know who put the furniture that we got together? Together. It came from IKEA. I didn't know all that was like a model car. <laughs> a thousand pieces. You know who put that furniture together for me? I never asked. The former chief of staff of Errol Sharon, the prime minister, himself took it on. Sent me a little video clip of Auburn and said, Pastor, in four hours I'll have this put together for you. Amen. I'm, I'm just telling you. So I said, Lord, you do it. Because I have no clue what I'm doing. But I'm excited about what God is doing. Amen. So I ask you to continue to pray for us. The Lord's will would be done. I'm not saying we won't plant a church. We obviously want to help the Arabic pastors and folks and whatever. But I, I, I promised myself, I believe, and the Lord, that whatever he does, he'll just be the one to do it. Amen. I just want to walk in his will. Can you say amen? amen. Would you stand with me tonight? I've only preached this is the third, well, Two Sundays back to back, but only two services. This will be the third time out uh, since May the 17th. And uh, I asked that doctor when I looked up at that screen, I said, can you stint that? I have very minor symptoms. But that seven major blockages, I haven't eaten good folks, I can tell you. <laughs> And he said, I make a living doing this, but I can't, I can't fix that. When he said that to me, I knew what that meant. I wasn't happy about it at all. I was shocked. But uh, these two and a half, almost three, well, three months now. Yes, three months, the 17th. It has been quite a, a venture and ordeal, but I'm thankful every day. And I told Brother uh, Owens, I said, I see grace in everything now. Yeah. My first service back to church, young preacher got up. He was visiting from Florida and he made this comment about grace and he said, Well, so that's when you get saved and you know whatever and I'm sitting there thinking, son, you're just young. That's nothing wrong there's nothing wrong with that. But you just haven't found out about grace yet. Because as I get older I see it everywhere. Yes. Yes. Amen. Yes. Grace. Yes. When he baptized me, I was telling him when he baptized me in the Holy Ghost, that was grace. Because yes. I couldn't live right without it. Right. Amen. Amen. Right. When I'm on another subject. That's good, Would you turn with me to 1 Corinthians, the 16th chapter? What I have is quite different. And. Ever, probably maybe the first day Brother Terry invited me to share with him, preach here. This is what I felt. This was born during the darkest valley. Prolonged trial that I'd ever faced as a Christian, as a preacher. That wasn't the surgery. Well, over a year and a half ago, it was a very long time, a very, no way to explain it, and I wouldn't, very personal. But this was born out of that adversity. You may not agree with it. I don't mean doctrinally. There won't be anything to conflict with the Scripture. But I mean everything I say tonight, and I believe everything I'm going to say. And I want you to help me preach. 
Verses 13 and 16. Watch ye. Stand fast in the faith. Which ye like men. Be strong. Let all your things be done with charity. I beseech you brethren. You know the house of Stephanus. That it is the first fruits of Achaia. And that they have addicted. Somebody say addicted. Addicted. themselves to the ministry of the saints that you submit yourselves unto such and to everyone that helpeth with us and laboreth and I just want to title this tonight Addicted would you pray with me for me tonight Father thank you thank you for the privilege to stand here to share the word of God and as always, I have no talent, I have no ability to say or do anything that would affect anybody except you give it. You are my source. I pray for fresh oil, fresh unction, fresh anointing. Pray for the people that you would anoint them to hear and receive the word. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You may be seated. Addicted in the Greek, it means uh, it's a prolonged form of a primary verb to arrange in an orderly manner. It means simply to put it in a certain position, but then addict, to point, determine. It is methodical. It, uh, it's an addiction. The word addiction in here means orderly or planning. Webster says it means to devote or surrender oneself to something habitually or obsessively. I was uh, in a place some maybe the past year and I just simply said, I have an addiction. Man, I got their attention, I can tell you. <laughs> the word seems out of place in the context of Christian ministry. Harsh and strong. But there are some strong words in the text that I read. It said, quit you like men, stand fast, be strong. That leads us to this verse concerning the household of Stephanus and their addiction to the ministry. Now, of course, the word addiction, it provokes some thoughts to our natural thinking. You know, especially those of us who have battled the carnal side of the word, whether it was drugs or alcohol or something else but in this verse and in this context the word and its meaning are not base they are not carnal but they are spiritual they are sacred it has a sense of commitment and divine calling about it but if you will afford me for just a moment here the liberty of using the natural and even the carnal comparison for just a moment you know, just as I can tell, and I, I'm not saying I can do this every time, obviously, but I can tell a drug addict or an alcoholic by their actions. I can tell often by their physical appearance, their speech, their habit, you know, things of that nature. It doesn't take very long, you know. I, I was in Colorado with my friend some two years ago, maybe it was, and on Sunday after the morning service, we went to lunch at, at the, from the church. And there, we started around into the restaurant, and the pastor's son was walking with me as a young boy, and a car, I thought, was going to back out. And I said, son, what, you watch that car. Somebody is erratic there. But I got out, away from it, and I stood on the inside of the restaurant. I looked through those windows into the car, and I said to the pastor's wife, that lady is a meth addict. Well, how would you know? Well, she had all the signature markings, and I could go into that, of a meth addict. You know, you can see that. You know, you can tell that. But I can also tell when Christians are addicted. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm not talking about the drugs or prescription drugs or something carnal of that nature, but they're addicted to ministry, addicted to the gospel, and addicted to the cause of Jesus Christ. You can tell that by their, their speech or their habits, their lifestyle because of the addiction. You know, what I'm going to say tonight is... Uh, they're going to get a little edgy, if you will, but I, 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 I'm living in a time when ministry has become a thing of game playing with so many people. Can you say amen? amen. Uh, so many people. But the, the earth, there was an old saying we used to hear, you hear when I was a young man. You know, this kind of gets to where the rubber meets the road. And I believe what we're going to see tonight is that that separates those game players from those like the house of Stephanus who cannot do enough or give enough or get enough or love enough or minister enough. Amen. Their words, their action, their commitment, their devotion, their passion betrays them and they are the addicted people and you know that they're addicted. Yes. You know that there's a lot of Christians that I've met over the years, a lot of them in fact that are not addicted. In fact, there's a lot of preachers who aren't addicted. There are evangelists. There are missionaries that I've met on the mission field, actually, that they know something about sacrifice. But I'm telling you, I know that they are not addicted. You see, because in the natural, addicts are not necessarily methodical or organized. I, I didn't plan out my life for the next day in a planner when I was a drug addict at all. I just knew if the stuff was there, it's going to be a high day. Do you hear what I'm saying? It was not methodical. It was not planned. But, but you know, they, there's one thing you can say about addicts. They're passionate. They're consumed by what they are addicted to. Can you? I, I didn't put that in the Bible. I didn't put the word addicted. I know, I know. It doesn't, again, it doesn't have the base of the carnal meaning. But, but in a sense, there has to be passion. And you can see it in people in the believer's life that is addicted to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're, we're not living in our grandpa's church age. Come on now. I, my my great-grandmother was a Pentecostal preacher. She was credentialed with the Church of God in Cleveland, Tennessee, and I've heard so many wonderful stories, but I'm not living in, in the age of my great-grandmother. In fact, my mother was a great Pentecostal, a great Christian, but I'm not even living in her age and in her time because, uh, uh, you know, Brother Clendenin was a, a great Christian, but we're not even living in the age that he ministered in. Folks, this thing is changed changed and it's changed rapidly. We're, we're in a different world now. The whole the, We're in a world of insanity. We're in a world when according to Mr. Uh, the, the, who does those studies, you know, about uh, millennials and the baby boomers, Barna Research and all of that. We're living in an age when people do not believe that this is the Word of God. We're living in an age when people do not believe the church is relevant to society. We're living in an age when even Christians so called in the modern church uh, have no real concept of the gospel and of what Christianity is. We're living in an age when that youth out there, that young world that's around us, uh, it, it, they're, they're not going to be reached by Sunday school. And I'm not against Sunday school, but it's going to take more than Sunday school to reach them in this end time. It's going to take somebody that is addicted to this gospel. Somebody that's addicted to ministry. You know, I may say some things you don't agree with. Some of the stories you may find a little shocking. But you know, especially in this modern time, if we are living what we come to know as the normal Christian life, I found out that don't work. 
The I love Jesus. Jesus is my Lord. I'm going to heaven someday. Christian who knows very little, if anything, about the passionate, committed, cross-bearing life of the addicted. Those people who are wonderfully and gloriously and joyously believe it and, 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 and believe it or not, thankfully addicted to ministry that they, they can't get enough. You know, I, I wanted to go to the Bible, to the Word of God. I said, God, talk to me about somebody in that New Testament we're all familiar with. And the Apostle Paul was first on the list. And in Acts 16 and 9, he said, a vision appeared to Paul in the night and there stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, come over to Macedonia and help us in verse 10. After he had seen the vision immediately, we endeavored to go to, into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called for us to preach the gospel unto them. You said, well, so what? Well, the thing about it is Macedonia didn't have an active church. Well, they had a vision, yes. Uh, he had a vision of a man saying, come help us. Like our brother said, there were believers that not had been born again yet. Yeah. For God said, I have much people in this city. Well, where are they at? Well, they haven't got it yet, but they're going to be. But, but this part of the world was a hotbed of paganism. It was a hotbed of persecution for anything that defied the gods of the day. They were going to go into a place to where, you know, they, they weren't open to the gospel. They didn't like it when a preacher came around and their life was on the line. You know, one of the old commentators said that they were going into an extensive pagan land where there were going to be trials and days dangers and said with notwithstanding that all this prospect of danger Paul and Silas cheerfully responded and gave themselves to the work. Now I thought why would why would these men go into such a pagan territory? Why not go where the gospel at least has made some inroad and you know I don't know about you but I, I went into some places uh, uh, in, in my Christian experience in ministry where it, it was almost as if if all of them were heathens, amen. Yeah. I went to Russia before, and I'm telling you, in the in Siberia, I was in central Siberia, and I'm not sure anybody was saved, but me and the preacher and his wife, the young couple there that I went to help plant that church, uh, they, they were opposed to the gospel. They were in this one particular area, and I know there was revival in Russia, and I've experienced that, but here, man, they stood against me, and they stood up. Well, you know, that's one thing, but to know that you're going to go die, that you're going to be persecuted. And I thought, why would they go? And I thought, because he was addicted. Yeah. Paul was addicted yeah. to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now that example is very mild, if you will. Now let me give you one a little stronger about the Apostle Paul. I found it in Acts 21 and 4. And finding disciples, we tarried there seven days who said to Paul through the Spirit that he should not not go up to Jerusalem. Yes, yes, yes. Now, did you read that with me? Yes, yes. Through the Spirit that he should not go up to Jerusalem. Now there's too many verses. Uh, but he started in that 21st chapter and said, We stayed there, carried there many days. And there came down from Judea a prophet named Agabus. And he, he took Paul's girdle, bound his own hands and feet, and said, Thus saith the Holy Ghost, so shall the Jews of Jerusalem bind the man that owneth this girdle, and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. And they said, When we heard all these things, we besought him. Don't go to Jerusalem, Paul. No, listen, the Holy Ghost has warned you not to go. And the Apostle Paul said, Why are you, why are you breaking my heart? Why are you causing me to weep? Why, I'm not ready to be bound only, but I'm ready to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the writer said, We just shut up. That, that's modern need. We just shut up. We said, Let the will of the Lord be done. Paul sends for disciples to come. 
from Ephesus and they come and he said you know you you know from the very day I started preaching in Asia I told you the truth I preached the gospel I, I wasn't a man after usury I, I came here to share with you gave everything the Holy Ghost has warned me not to go to Jerusalem but, but I, I want to tell you that when I leave here I'm free from the blood of all men yeah. I'm free here from the blood of all men for I'm not shunned to declare the counsel of God now when you read that folks I say this is what I wrote it's one of those areas in scripture for certain that cannot be fully understood with the natural mind you say how is that he, he, he just is willing to die for the gospel no that's not the part that's hard to understand Paul is constantly being warned not by believers who say we've got secret intelligence that's coming to us from Jerusalem and they're saying they're waiting on you there. We, we've got the Messiah. They're waiting. They're, they're letting us know that they're going to get you. With, no, no, that's not it. He, he said, listen, you, you are, have been warned by the Holy Ghost. You've been warned by the gifts of the Spirit. You've been warned by the prophets of God. Remember verse 4. Said, said Paul, to Paul through the Spirit that he should not Go to Jerusalem. Now all my Christian life in that church I was raised up in until I got away from it, I was always taught when the Holy Ghost tells you something, buddy, you better do it. Yeah, right. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. My mentor, Brother B.H., I'm telling you, if anybody believed in walking after the Holy Ghost, do what he said to do, he did it. But I listen, folks, I'm going to tell you, I, he just said, Paul said, it doesn't matter what awaits me there. It doesn't matter what I have to go through to declare the gospel in Jerusalem and then on to Rome. I am going anyway. Yeah, man. Yes, sir. Come on. I, I'm going anyway. You say, preacher, that doesn't seem rational. Be warned by the Spirit not to go and then determined you are going. Now, in the modern church, and even in my, I would consider that person a rebel. Uh, you know, I, I mean, hey, you, you're going against me. That's, that's nonsense. I mean, I'm trying to get the Holy Ghost to talk to me, tell me what to do. He's telling you what to do, and you're going totally against what he says. Are you hearing that, folks? I mean, he's telling you you're going against what he said. Somebody would watch wrong with him. I mean, that's not rational. What's wrong with this brilliant, educated, Holy Ghost? A filled apostle who wrote most of the New Testament. I'm going to tell you what's wrong with him. He is addicted. He's addicted to the ministry of the gospel and the ministry of the saints. He said in 1 Corinthians 9, 16, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me, a woe is me if I preach not the gospel. You see, with Paul, it wasn't a career move. It wasn't about getting a bigger church. I was raised up in a denomination. I'm not an anti-denomination, but I know about such things. I, I know that every year at the old, the old count meeting, state count meeting, or you would call them district count meetings, they were always there. It's like horse swapping on, uh, on trade day, you know. <laughs> trying to get a different church, you know, get a bigger church. It wasn't about getting a better parsonage, you know, house to live in. It wasn't positioning yourself for a seat on the council of the denomination. It wasn't about an appointment to the office. No, it's not about getting a TV ministry going or program or a missionary appointment or bigger ministry. No, no. He's addicted to the ministry of the saints. He's addicted to the preaching of the gospel to the reaching of the lost of this world. It may not make sense. No, not at all because he's driven. He cannot help but go. I don't have any other explanation. Listen, I'm not sure he could offer them who kept 
asking them not to go or rational explanation about it because I'm not sure they would have understood if he would have told them that only the addicted would understand why he's going even after the spirit warned him of arrest and torture and jail and death I just wrote in my notes this is holy spirit infused passion that the Holy Ghost puts in a believer in their life that no matter what they're determined they're going to carry this gospel to a lost and dying world that's the kind of people we must have in modern Christianity. That's the kind of believer, the kind of preacher, the kind of teacher, the kind of missionary, the kind of evangelist, you know, the kind of witness that we need in this modern time. Brother B.H. told the story many years ago. He said he was in the North Pole. It was back in the 80s on the Canadian side. And he said, I went to an Indian village there called Waskagish. He said, that by the time that I arrived, there had been a revival going on for seven years. And he said, I was there for one week with the Cree Indians. And he said, I've never been any closer to heaven than there. He said, that the pastor's son the pastor was a Cree Indian, but the pastor's son told him the story of how the revival came and what happened. He said that this little preacher, Cree Indian, worked in the coal mines in Canada. He couldn't even read or write. Finally, the Spirit of the Lord gave him the ability to read the Bible, and that was the only thing he could read was the Bible. He never made it past the first grade. And he was working deep in the coal mines of Canada and he said that God dealt with him and called him out of those mines to go up to watch Kaganish to the top of the world to establish a church. For the first six years he preached there was 1,100 Cree Indians in that village. And he preached for six years and he never had a convert. He preached for six years to a people that were totally heathen, heathenized, if you will. I'm not sure if that's in Webster, but if ain't, I made it up. But the Cree Indians, they were drunk. Some had been drunk for nearly 40 straight years. Go to bed drunk, wake up, back drinking again. They would take their children, their little babies and their kids, and they'd give them drugs, or if I'm not getting the story confused, they'd take the rags, old rags, and douse them with gasoline, and put them in the room with the babies and the children where the fumes would put them to sleep. They would have their drunken orgies all night long. They, they were a wicked demon possessed. He said it was one of the most demon possessed places in this world. For six years he preached Never had a convert, not one. He said, after he said, after my dad would preach, he said they would come during the night and drag him out of our house. It would be minus 40 degree temperature. And they'd drag my dad out in the snow and strip him off naked and beat him till the blood would run out of his body. And he said, when they walked away, my mother, my sister, and I would go out there and pull him up out of the snow. He's bleeding all over and bring him back in the house and clean him up. And the young son said, I begged my daddy to leave. Yeah. I said, Daddy, they're going to kill you here in this village. If maybe not you, they'll kill us. Why? Why would you stay? You haven't had a convert. You've been here six years. They beat you over and over. They stripped your clothes off of you. Why, Daddy, won't you leave? And he said, my daddy said, because I'm pregnant with God. Yeah. And I can't leave till I birth that life. Oh, do you hear me, folks? After six years, the young son said, but what? 
one day my daddy went down into the square of that village as he had so often to preach the word of God and said I followed him down there to sway till he got through to see if they beat him I'd have to bring him home and he said my daddy walked down there after six years and he began to preach the word of God but he said this time it was different he said when he started preaching the Holy Ghost began to blow through that village he said men that had been drunk for 38 long years were instantly sober and became born again of the Spirit of God. Brother Condemnon said, when I was there, out of a village of 1,100 Cree Indians, 700 of them, adults had been baptized in the Holy Ghost. 700 had been baptized in the Holy Ghost. You say, what's wrong with that man? I mean, think about it. What, what, what could possess such a man? Why did he think about his family, if not himself? What, what was he doing to them, you know, staying there, seeing the pain and the anguish that they were going through? How could a man like that stay there for six years without a convert? The beatings, the rejection, all... I'll tell you why. Because he was addicted. He was addicted to the gospel. He was addicted to the ministry of this gospel. I know I'm going to get criticized, but I wonder how many of the darling TV preachers would go to walk, watch Caganish and stay for six years. Come on now. No converts. Stripped naked in minus 40 degree cold. Beaten. With no big crowds there adoring them. Come on now. No big crowds to encourage them in their mega auditorium. You say, preacher, no, that's not fair. Well, I know I may be a little harsh in that, but I've always got to deal with that somewhere along the line because I see the, the frivolity of all of that. You say, they're not called there. You're, you're right. You're right. But they are addicted. They are addicted. I can assure you that they're addicted to the to the money, the fame, the private jets, the multiple fancy homes, the limos, and the adoring crowd. Say amen, somebody. I love that old song. I'd rather have Jesus than silver gold. I'd rather be healed than have riches than gold. C.T. Studd probably one of the most famous cricket players in all of England's history. He and his wife both were born into somewhat wealthy families. And C.T. Studd and his wife became Christians, believers. The story goes that when Studd received his inheritance and his wife somewhere about the same time their parents passed away, they received a large inheritance. One day he was writing out a check and his wife said, what are you doing, C.T.? And he said, I'm, I'm giving my inheritance to missions. She said, what? He said, yeah, I, I don't want this. And she said, he said, you can do what you want with yours, but that's not mine, it's your family's. And she said, and you receive the blessings of God and me not. And she wrote her with God. <laughs> I'm not saying everybody has to give away their inheritance. I'm just telling you what, what kind of man he was. Amen. It would have made more sense to have kept it because here, here's what happened in the future. He was called to Africa. This is where it may get a little iffy, folks. He was called to Africa to go up, I think, the Congo, way up the river off the coast of the Congo, and they were going to establish a mission station with around a hundred young missionaries and their wives. They would go out of that mission station all over that part of Africa to preach the gospel and to establish churches. But for C.T. Studd to be able to do that, he needed money and a lot of it. How many of it takes money to operate this thing? Well, for whatever reason, the only way that was going to happen and work the sister stud was going to have to stay in England and run the mission agency that ran, that raised the money, sent the funds. She'd have to stay there to run that. 
And he would go and be over those young couples there as the missionary in Africa. Folks, for 13 years, they never saw each other. I thought about that. 13 years, Brother and Sister Stud never held each other in their arms. For 13 years, they never kissed each other goodnight. Or carried on a conversation because there were no phones. Letters came by ship months to get there. 16 years or 13 years she was faithful raising that money to make sure it got to the Congo where those young men and women and Brother Stud could go out and preach the gospel and plant churches and reach the natives for Christ. 13 years. 13 years. After 13 years Sister Stud got on a ship She's going to Africa to see her husband. She got to the coast and took that boat ride up the river up the Congo. They said when she got there, he met her down to the, at the dock and all oh, his heart was glad. And everyone that was there in, in the compound at the time greeted her and Sister Stud got off of the boat. And when she, he took her around and he showed her the, the, the agency there, the mission compound, so proud. You, you have raised that money. You invested your life. This is what's been done. All these natives you see here, they're converts working, helping us out here in the compound. And then she goes with him into his little hut and stays just a few days, not very long at all. But she stays just a few days in that hut with him. Think about it, folks. And said when she came out, she makes her way down to that river, gets in on that dock, steps on that boat, and never looks back. Not one time didn't turn around, didn't look back, goes back. You say, wait a minute, what, what kind of people do that? That's not even normal. That's not natural. That, that, that's not even Christian. You know, you, what, what kind of a person does that? What kind of people go that far in a ministry? In ministry? I'll tell you what kind of people. It's addicted people. It's people that are addicted. You can criticize them. You, you can say what you want. You can say that's not right if you will. I'm just telling you they were addicted to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm preaching a little slow tonight. I'm having to build back up. Some time ago, I mentioned over a year and a half ago, I passed through one of the darkest Valleys of ministry, Christian life. Too complex, too complicated, and I wouldn't tell you if I could. And during that time, it put a lot of thinking. I'm looking back at ministry. I've never been attacked like that, I guess you could say, by certain people, and it was just bad. And I looked back and I thought, you know, I thought, man, I, I've made a lot of mistakes along this journey. I heard a dear pastor one time, he's a great friend. He got up in his church, he's 80 something now, and he said, I, I've never changed one thing. Not one thing. And I sit there and I thought, buddy, not me. Yeah. You don't have a piece of paper big enough. I did not change. Yeah. But hey, somebody, some's got it, some of us don't. And I thought, man, but you know, there's some things I've done, no matter how bad it hurt or how bad the people would seem, I'd do it all over again. But for some reason, I think, I know, I don't think, I know, dealing with this trial, this dark place, folks, they just days, man. I'm, I'm thinking, God, not, not. Help me to hold on to Christianity, to Christ. But I'm talking about, man, I, it, it, it's just dark. And I'm having all these thoughts, things. And I was thinking back in times past when my kids were small. We, we traveled, one and I and the two daughters, real young, in a 45-foot fifth wheel. 
and evangelizing and preaching. But after a period of time, you know, I feel like, well, maybe they need to be in a regular school. Maybe, maybe we need a house. You know, I'll be honest with you, that's one of those type things I changed. I kept the fifth wheel. I kept homeschooling our kids and kept them with me. But I did. But we put them in a in a little local school, and so the thing was, Daddy's got to go preach, you know. I got to go travel and preach, and they're staying there, and she's going to put them in school, and and so uh, I'd have to leave them to preach the gospel. And I remember my youngest daughter; she's the prodigal now, and she uh, uh, she I was walking up the steps one day. She was young and standing there in the living room. And I heard her say, I guess my daddy doesn't love me anymore. He leaves me all the time. I remember packing my suitcase and my girls would come around the bed when they were little and they'd say, Daddy, why do you have to leave again so soon? And I'd say, Honey, Daddy has to go win souls. And I'd get in my car and I drove a lot back in those days. I leave it to Delta now, but <laughs> I'd, I'd start across into Georgia and down to Florida, a lot of ministry in Florida. And I, I'd get in my car and I'd have a knot in my throat that I couldn't, and I'd want to turn around. I'm honest with you. I wanted to turn around. I wanted to call the pastor and say, I'm not coming. I can't come. I can't do it. But I just kept going. I'd kiss them goodbye. Listen, but during this dark, dark time, I had a situation. I was in California and I was headed then uh, from California to preach at a missions conference in Mississippi. And in this missions conference, it was to raise money, not for me, not for the missions I was doing. It was for some other folks and good people and they were raising money to help the kids of Dominican Republic and the, and the uh, Philippine Islands and it was just to help them raise the money the man had said this that was not an incentive to get me to go but he said listen you, I'll come he said I'll tell you what I'll, I'll, I'll get you a plane ticket I'll help you with an offer I said don't but he said I will you know so it's whatever but we'll just I'll come help you man I felt that burning in my spirit there was going to be a, a a Christian school group, of, uh, when I say school, I don't mean kids that were part of a, a Christian training group going to be there, young men, young women that was going to be an, impacted by this. And I just felt, but at that time, man, a, a, a situation came up back home with a, a, a kind of a family member, you know, close, not blood, but close, but, but man, just really bad situation. Uh, they, they, they almost died, folks. They, they, cold blue and it was bad and I, I changed things. I go there. I pray to God. You touch them and others were praying and then the, it was just, they were almost going to leave here but then God intervened and touched them. The doctor, the surgeon said, it's a miracle. It's a miracle. That's what they said. It's a miracle. So I go, you know, I'm there with family. I'm there. But that's burning in my spirit, Mississippi. Now my flesh has stayed. My flesh said, "Family, you got You need to be here." My flesh told me, "You know, you, you, man, that's nuts. You, you don't need to leave. Call them, tell them." But I couldn't get that out of my heart, my spirit. So I said, I, "I've got to go. I don't. I, I've got to go." Well, I, I went. Listen, you, you cannot imagine what that caused. You, you cannot imagine what that created. You cannot imagine. I mean, there's no way. You said, well, that explained it again. I wouldn't, but I'm, listen, it was like a knife, folks. I mean, like a dagger. I was told how selfish I was. I'm thinking, God, I give you my life. I've given my life to help people. But I was told how selfish. It, it, oh, it's really complicated, but it was a bad thing. And you know, I just, I, I, I said to a person, I said to him, I said, listen, I left my own mother's bedside and I went to, the, to go to Romania. Gwen and I were going to Romania and she had a massive heart attack. They, they couldn't do open heart surgery for two weeks and had to let her heart heal. And I knew that I, Romania's in my spirit. I'd lay across motel beds and weep over it, you know, but 
but I, I thought, I can't leave her. I've got to be here. She's the pillar of our family. It don't make sense, but I couldn't get that out of my spirit how I needed to go. I never said that to her. I wouldn't have told her that. But I, I go home. I'm there at that hospital in Chattanooga every day, brother. I'm there with her. I mean, we. I mean, day and night. And and I go home across the mountain to get her clothes for Gwen and I. And I, I stopped by the old church there. I had a key that I was raised in to pray. And I walked back and forth in front of that altar. And I said, God, you've got to help me. That's my mother. She's facing open heart surgery. They don't know that she'll live through it. And I can't get this out of my spirit about romance. Mania, what's what's going on here? I, I get to the hospital back in Chattanooga, and I've not said anything. My mother looks up at me in that bed, and she says to me, "Son, you got to go to Romania." And I said, "No, I can't leave you, mother." I go, "Oh," she said, "Yes, you can." She said, "Son, God's called you for this, and if you stay here, you'll put me before God." And she said, "Son, you can never ever do that." Amen. My God, you can never do that. Uh, we went, folks. Worst, worst experience. When I finally made it back, when I from Romania, we had not only no fruit, but there's a disaster. The whole thing was a disaster. My mother died a week later. I, I'm just telling you, that, that's the way it was. But I told somebody, I said, I left my own mother's bedside. You can call me selfish. You can say whatever you will. I've had people to question the motives. I'm talking about addiction tonight. Uh, people talk about, uh, you know, the things that we do. They, they say, well, you know, they don't, they don't understand what drives, drives. Uh, that some say you're addicted to the crowds. Uh, I've been accused. To that I don't know if you have. You're addicted to the crowd. So you're addicted to the response from that audience. You're addicted to the attention of the people, the, the attention given to that preacher, the accolades of men. You know that uh, you know that uh, you go in and preach, they take you to the Longhorn, and you know all of that. You know that that's actually been brought up, and I thought, really, are you kidding me? Really. There wasn't anything, anything there. No accolades, nobody. When I stood on the side of that old dusty road in Venezuela, it must have been 100 degrees at night. I stood there with a microphone that wouldn't nobody cheered me on. Nobody there to help me. And I'm preaching to anybody that will listen to me. Anybody that will drive by and hear the gospel. I thought really that there was no accolades there. I didn't have anybody pushing me and blessing me and wanting to take me out to eat. When I got on that old plane going to Siberia, they ain't nobody knew where I was going. I sure didn't, and they didn't know. They just sent me and told me somebody would be there. Well, it, it, I, I'm, I'm on that old plane going to Siberia. I'm in an old village. I hadn't had to go to a toilet since I was a kid, three or four years old. I'm not about a, no bathroom in the house, just a toilet out in the weeds with a flashlight. I, I'm there preaching. I thought, wait a minute. There ain't nothing fun about this at all. We're not going to the Longhorn when this is over. I can tell you that right now. No, no, there was no accolades. There was no crowds. There was nobody there. When I'm riding that old bus in, in Columbia through that guerrilla territory, and the man told me, he said, they pull people off that bus all the time. And if you're a foreigner, those guerrillas are taking, kidnap you. I'm going to start a school of Christ. That's the only way I knew to get there. There was nothing. Listen, when I went to an old drunkard's prison, in Russia, that's right. A prison for alcoholics. They didn't try to rehabilitate them there. They didn't put them through an AA program there. Mr. If you was an habitual alcoholic in those days, you went to the darkest old prison you have ever can imagine. I went in there with hardened men. The old warden was an old general. He's hard, angry. They're sitting there, scowls on their face. It's cold. They've never heard the gospel in their life. It wasn't nobody saying amen. Bless him, Jesus. Touch him, Lord. It's just me and 150, 200 men full of the devil. Now my alcoholism, I thought, no. That's not a ministry high. There's nothing there at all. Listen, I told my daughter that we had no opposition. I'm just talking to her on 
the phone in the airport. I'm going through this time. I said, I'm going to tell you, dear, I was a dead man when God found me. I was a dead man walking when he found me. And I also, I said, I, I was a piece of human trash. Ain't nobody no lower filthier than I was. And I said, I owe him everything. And I said, honey, I'm, I'm not going to quit preaching this gospel. I'm not going to quit getting on those airplanes and going to take this gospel to wherever 